we'll count this in and we'll just um right okay right okay tony blackburn it's fine right is this coming up on the screen what you're seeing on your screen yeah yeah i'm seeing the what language we're all good right okay so we don't want that we want to dismiss that i'll just double check this is all running yeah it's all fine so um we'll just we'll we're counting um and i just make sure my things are on the screen and okay hang on right so if we do that there do we do testing 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 okay um all oh, right okay oh uh, you you um you you read you read that out after three and I'll and then I'll mention part one of the discussion. Okay, after three, um, three, two, one, action. What language did King Arthur speak? Part one of a discussion between Carl James Langford and Luke. Now, Luke, this self has to be at the edge of controversy, and. We need to look at the very language that a king or kings known as Arthur spoke. Where do you sit with that? Do you sit on the saddle or do you sit as we mean to go on? Well, I think the first thing you've got to figure out is which King Arthur are we talking about? Because there is possibly five. I think you were saying there's up to five, but I know at least of three within the Welsh history, two that were called Arthur, and one that was Myrig, Arthur's father, that used the name Uther. So which one are we talking about? Uh, do, do, you know, do you know what, right, for the sake of argument, let, let's just do, let's do all of them. Because, yeah. Well, because, people do, assume, uh, when you think of King Arthur, you think of the round table, don't you? You think of uh, that Arthur, which would be Arthur II, so we could, the one that fights the Anglo-Saxons. Do you, know, do, you know, do you know what? The, the, the problem with King Arthur is when anyone ever talks about King Arthur, it, it's, it's almost as if we are looking at one figure and then we're constantly corrected. There were many more than one King Arthur. Now, if we, if we think about the work of Black and Wilson, it, we, we look at Arthur 1 and Arthur 2. But I feel there's a lot more to it than that as you've already mentioned the fascination again with the title what language did king arthur speak and looking at all the arthurs i think is sensible because i think we can look at time period roughly between the early 400s going somewhere into the 500s and loosely, some of the languages that we do look at are going to be within that period. Well, th this is where it gets even more convoluted, because the thing is, as we know, knights didn't even appear in history until Charlemagne in the 8th century. And it's the knights, as we know them, are a medieval creation, you know, adorned in their armour. So it does bring up the question of whether this is something that occurred later in history than we are led to believe, which again is backed up by the thing I want to bring up later about Maddock Morfran, who supposedly travelled to America. And there's a, an issue with the dating there that might back up this theory. But if you look at any of the paintings of Arthur and his round table, you'll notice that they're all designed in the medieval period. And obviously, when we think about this, we can immediately look towards Jeffrey Ash. Oh, we can't use that, can we? Uh, we immediately <laughs> mention Jeffrey Ash, and we mention the likes of Glastonbury and Wells and, and all that stuff. And this is an interesting thing. Can you tell us about the point of this age? When, okay. You're going to be smited with a huge bolt of lightning now. But tell us your time frame of King Arthur's. When, 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 when is this King Arthur? When, when, where is he in history? What, what are the dates in your mind? 
Well, well, this is the, the problem is that I'm suffering quite a bit of cognitive dissonance at the moment because there are so many different dates that it possibly could be. If you look at the work of like Fomenko, for example, he would say that all these things would have happened in the medieval period and they've been pushed back to kind of fill out our history, uh, whether as a means of falsification or simply just because we don't actually know what happened and they don't want to tell us that. So there's there's possibly two there's, they're the same people that I believe are there, but it's just whereabouts in history they were. I think these are the same people they're discussing, the King Arthur II, that uh, like you do see the connection between the Knights of the Round Table and the Templars, which is a lot of evidence uh, started in Nevern in Wales, which is you know where the cross is supposedly located, which makes sense. We're we talking about Nevern in West Wales, yeah? Yes, yes, we are. Yeah, where, yeah, yeah. You know, as we know, it's built with the Star Mound of Cygnus, which is the swan, which is also for the, you know, for the cross. Uh, the the Templars could be the knights of the round table, as we see with Arthur. But again, we're left with this dating problem, because if we jump over to, to Mobile Bay, because I may as well mention it now, Mobile Bay in Alabama, we actually find a monument uh, at a place called Fort Morgan, which, as we know, King Morgan, Glamorgan, uh, at a place called Fort Morgan, it says, in the memory of Prince Maddock, a Welsh explorer who landed on the shores of Mobile Bay in 1170 and left behind with the Indians the Welsh language. Now, obviously, that is referring to the Prince Maddock Morfran, who was the brother of Arthur II, son of King Myrig, um, who, according to the Welsh histories, the Welsh annals, say that he left for the New World in about 570 uh, AD, I believe is when he found it. Um, but he, well, no, he, he left, sorry, immediately after the comet, which uh, was supposedly in 562 AD, and he ended up in America. But obviously, this is saying that he ended up there in 1170. So that's a 600 year gap, but definitely the same person. What are the chances that two Maddox from Wales land in the same place and meet Indians and leave that language behind? Not there's, two, there's, there's two points that you make there. I, I, think, I think it's incredibly difficult in this recording today um, to think about the date stuff. Um, and I think that's another record. I, I'm, uh, I would like to say David Zora's, you know, Blue Planet series to even get get the tip of the iceberg of this chronology stuff because there's, you know, so many differences. Yeah, you got Chrétien uh, de Troyes is is ideas of King Arthur in eleven hundreds, and obviously we we've got all the Glastonbury stuff and and so on. You you mentioned earlier on about this thing about knights of the Round Table, but. Strangely enough, when you when you look at when you look at Roman history, uh, the idea of the knight, the idea of 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 the one who's got custody of the Roman state, is something that writers seem to be pushing a lot more of. This is in the Roman world now. This is in the three four hundreds, right? The word knight. The, 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 we're not talking about chivalry, but then then you've got the the other um, tender mention of the knights and you're thinking well but they're not the knights that um Christian destroyers or any other writers are talking about in regards that they're not those ones with armor and all the rest of it but then again there was plate armor in the roman period and and what the, the, the problem is what we're what we're doing we're going into another subject here this is definition of the word knights uh, but one thing we need to hone in on is obviously this thing about the language. Now, you did actually mention something really interesting there about about events that are occurring in the forties, five fifties. So, if I if I look at um, from my academic side, uh, ac academic archaeology, uh, we're looking at the plague of um, Emperor Justinian, the the, the emperor of the um, Eastern Roman Empire, and, and, and Justinian's looking to blame a lot of the loss of life in Europe, at least 250 million in Europe uh, across, the, across the Western world being wiped out due to a plague. Um, and then we, we, we're looking at that and we're looking about this, this great comet. But how is this looking when we're looking at language? Um, what, what initially at the top of this, right, the King Arthur's, so, so if I if I be fair to people actually listening to this, maybe what we should is focus historically on on the written area between roughly late three hundreds all the way into about five fifty. So your guess is language 
was King Arthur or the any other King Arthur speaking? What what one would you would would you well, I, or what what was his mother tongue? Well, I think yeah, it'd, it'd have to be Welsh. With uh, I'd assume, which is obviously something we'll go into later, with Colburn as a form of written, but uh, Welsh is definitely what I would believe. The the stories of the Welsh Indians, uh, like say with Maddock going over there, and you can you know see the Welsh Indians are prevalent and. Um, that's something that is definitely been brought over from somewhere, unless, of course, which would create an even bigger mystery. They manufactured the Welsh language on their own or got it from another source. So, <laughs> which, yeah, which would make it even crazier, wouldn't it? But oh, uh, they're, they're, uh, Sorry, sorry yeah. to interrupt. There's something no. in archaeology called deterrism, right? Uh, may, may, maybe they evolved a uh, Welsh language um, determined on their environs rather than diffused from Wales. Uh, but then again, I think that's, uh, as a language, that's important. Well, um, according to Jim Michael, who is, um, it was a friend of Alan Wilson, they, you know, they found Christian Bibles with these, um, with these Native Americans that were speaking Welsh. Right. Which I, I, you know, so let's say they had manufactured the Welsh on their own. I don't think they've manufactured the Christian Bible. Well, Christianity is a bit of a coincidence. Um, you, you know, they, they, I, I really love the Native American, but I, I, I think, I, I think this whole going, going back to the going back to the King Arthur question as well. What language did King Arthur speak? Um, it, it's if, if if you were to ask me what language King Arthur spoke, um, the one image that we've got here um, is image showing Latin, right? Um, and immediately I'm going to be shot down in this recording and say, oh my God, you know. Um, Carl, you're doing you're doing your Roman thing again. <laughs> you're doing your Roman thing again. Stop it. We've discussed uh, this, Carl. They aren't real. <laughs> they are real. Yes, uh, you're doing your Roman thing again. But there is one one thing about this is that is that there's a really point that it's almost as if after um, Roman control of tracts of Britain slowly starting to end four twenty four thirty those types of dates. Uh, and, and this stuff about Honorius and the pleas of the Britons and all that rubbish. We won't do that. But but um, but Latin is slowly decaying um, and Ooh. being an extinct language. However, however, um, how how populous was the Latin language? Uh, it may Ooh. it may have only been with a few people anyway uh, and, and therefore it didn't decay it just remained with an elite and that's it so so therefore well, your the, point is there's two things make about latin sorry to interrupt there's two things i'd make about latin it. is uh the first is we actually don't have any original latin documents what we have are what copies that were made in you know at best the 12th 13th century most of them 14th 15th century uh, and yeah. we don't have those original copies it's the same for greek but we do have original uh, original copies of Colburn that's into things like you know carved into stones and stuff. So like I know that you you do believe that that is a, a fabrication, but um... oh no 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 um, I, I wouldn't say it's a fabrication, right? I'm not saying it's a fabrication, but but there's what you're saying is correct that, that that we we don't have any real documents in regards to the British context. Not many anyway, right? They're all copies. You are very right there. Yeah. Um, and go with your flow. Keep going. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, it begs the question, you know, well, like we say, we, we say it was a, a dead language. We don't know how it was spoken, yet it was used so prevalently in the 14th, 15th century and revived. It's, it's almost like it was something that wasn't used in those times. One thing that would go against that point is obviously uh, Alan Wilson claimed to find uh, the stone that was buried at, was it St. Peter's Church that he purchased in Wales, you know, and that had uh, something about Arturius Rex written on it. But one thing that was interesting about that was that the Latin was actually wrong. And everyone said, well, this is clearly a forgery because the Latin is wrong. And I thought, well, what if it's the other way around? And this is actually the correct way to write the Latin and we've been reading it wrong the whole time. Uh, that's a really good point. The, the the thing is, the thing is, when we um, but you 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 you've actually what I'm about to say is really relevant to this image, right? That there's, um, there's, in 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 Wales, for example, um, you know, I I can, I can run a conversation with with somebody in Welsh in Ceredigion. If I run a conversation with somebody in Welsh in Cardiff, right? I, 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 my my Cymraeg is different from somebody anywhere else. I can do it in Ceredigion. However, 
Um, sometimes, if I'm somewhere else, it, it's it's like um, it might be the Welsh that people, you know, you might say "dida" good day, or you might say "borada" good morning, right? Lots of people know "borada" and "dida," right? But they can't speak Welsh, right? Um, and maybe that's the same with Latin. See, for example, everyone knew what Rex meant, but they couldn't, they didn't have a clue what people were saying um, in a religious place, right? So when you're into the 400s, it might have been that only a few people ever knew any Latin anyway. Um, so it never really died. And actually, it de- never really died at all because Latin itself migrated into uh, the, the monastic bent. In, in other words, we should have actually had a, a, a Latin image. And, and um, when this recording does go out, we're, we're, there will be some stuff added to the video um, so people can look at it. But um, but I, I, I believe that um, the, 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 the question is, uh, let's ask ourselves a question. The first question is, we'll do the common eye stuff, right? Um, did, did any of the King Arthurs speak any Latin? Right? And I would say yes. From the principle I mentioned, whether they were fluent or not, I don't know. If you look at a census today, um, for example, I, on my census form, occasionally I put that, I, that that my first language is Welsh, right? Actually, my first language is English, but it might have been that day that I was speaking so fluent Welsh that I thought, right, my first language is Welsh. Except yeah. most of the time, it's English, right? Yeah. So I'm going to say that King Arthur was recognised as speaking some Latin. Um, whether he's fluent on it in that or not, I don't know. What do you think about that, Luke? Well, I think again, this would be going back to the first King Arthur. Definitely would have uh, had some ability to speak Latin because if we look at the uh, the supposed history, his father Magnus Maximus went over and Arthur I was his general. Uh, he, you know, attacked Paris with uh, Guinevere there, and then he went and had a battle with Gratian. Uh, where it, and they chased him to Leon, where they killed him, and that is obviously how Magnus became known as the usurper because he then carried on through Europe all the way to Constantinople, where he became emperor and took over. So you know, during that period, you can also find the trail going through you know across Europe of paintings of Arthur besieging cities. Like I think it's uh, Naples. I might be wrong on that, but there's definitely a few in Italy. You know, paintings of Arthur besieging their cities uh, as they made their way across Europe to uh so magnus maximus is someone that's you know survived into history but so it's very strange isn't it that his, his son arthur or as we call him artorius you know uh part of that Rex. yeah so him you'd, you'd assume that he would definitely speak um speak some kind of latin but then at the same time you've got to look at the the aspect of the when you're going to constantinople which is obviously rome upon the bosphorus that was notoriously greek so did he actually speak greek Greek. Oh God, we did put. Oh, this is why we've got to do a part two. We've got to do a part <laughs> two. And, and, and this, the thing is, the thing is, you, you have a couple of issues there. It, it, it's um, Latin is a traveller's language, so it's it's like when you when you go abroad, right? Um, um, you know, I I I could remember some of the English that I that I learned when I was in Spain, but it would be like um, um, it. it, it yeah, I can't remember any Spanish at this minute. It's really embarrassing. <laughs> but I, I, I know a little bit of, of Greek. In fact, in fact, I was working with a Greek person. In some it was like Palamera, Calaspera, Palanita, um, and Dati, and she thought I spoke fluent Greek, right? But yeah. then that's, I knew some words, right? I, I knew some um, Ena, Dio, um, uh, Trea, um, Pente, Tessera, Pente, that type of thing. Whatever, whatever, whether. Right, but the fact of the matter is, um, you probably knew some military catchphrases. Would you like to surrender, for example? <laughs> Latin, exactly, exactly. Do you know, do you know, um, this, this, this thing, and I'm very wary, wary of time. Look, we've done about 20 minutes, we haven't, we've done one image, <laughs> um, but, but, uh, yes, but this thing, what I'm going to say is this, right? I, I, I want to say this. I want to say a statement. I want you to tell me if, if it's right or not, right? So, um, oh, oh, well, we, we've done the Latin bit, right? We can do Latin again and the Latin bit for now, part one. Um, I, I believe that, yeah, he, he spoke uh, cum, cumric, cumrig, um he, he spoke um, a, a language which would have been understood, an old language 
right? An old language, which would have been... A, a, so in other words, what we're saying, we've got to be very careful now. What we're saying is the old language of Krag was always there with the higher languages, Latin. It's a bit like the ancient Greek. Or a lower script, the written script, and you've got the hieroglyphic, by 400, um, not ancient Greek, ancient Egyptian. Bloody, bloody hell. Um, so you, you've got... Um, You've got ancient Egyptian. The hieroglyph form of writing was extinct by about roughly about 400 years AD. But that was a higher form. Right? It's like on some buildings today. What we do see, we see Latin still, and nobody knows what the hell it says, right? But the lower form is English or Welsh, right? The come on, So the point is, um, people probably had, had spoken come on, for hundreds, if not thousand years before the Roman era, right? But it didn't necessarily need to be written down. In fact, why would you write in Cymraeg, right? We only start to see Cymraeg being seen on some stones, um, which are in Margam Stone um, sometime in the late 300s, early 400s. There was no need to write Cymraeg down because it, it was like the normal stuff. The only stuff you needed to write down was Latin. So um, definitely King Arthur spoke Welsh. What do you think, Luke? Well, I was going to just say the the reason why you wouldn't want to write uh, dad down on a stone is just because of all the the curves. <laughs> That's going to be really difficult for you to be you know carving into any kind of stone with all the you know the twists and turns, which is why Roman is so easy to to do on stones because you know it's, it's very straight. You know, it's not uh, it's not as straight, for example, as Sanskrit, but um, you know it's it's still easier for stones and that for well you can actually see that when henry the eighth decided to outlaw writing in wales and kill anyone that owned pen or paper um the way that they had to to get around that is they'd take sticks and they'd engrave them and that is the birth of the the, the cauldron without any curves because they obviously they couldn't make any curves on the sticks so they do everything straight lines which is why the cauldron became that straight lined version but again, that is something that's happening in Henry VIII's time. So it's much later than King Arthur II, which, you know, it, it raises questions, doesn't it? Because the Welsh Indians were also seen doing the exact same thing over in America. They were, you know, they were inscribing their cauldron in straight on sticks, you know. So how have they got that before that's kind of been invented to avoid Henry VIII? Very strange, isn't it? Uh, it is very strange. Um, very strange. Next. Oh, Saxon. Right, Saxon, yeah. Now, oh, no! Saxon, yeah. go for it. Right, well, I was, I was going to start off because um, there is a, an interesting map that we probably should have got up for this, but yeah, anyone that wants to Google it, you just look up, um, I think it's Britain in 570 AD on Google, and you'll get a map up, and it shows you how Wales controls basically, you know, everything. And, you know, Ang uh, Saxon is obviously down in one, one corner, and then just above, you also have Engel. So, you know, we're looking at two tiny places at this period of time. They're really not that significant. In fact, the Pictish control more land than they do. And, so, and um, what, what about King Arthur speaking uh, Saxon? So, so the origins of the origins of the Saxon script obviously is coming over from Europe. So we've got to be very, we've got to be very I, careful. I'm unsure he would have if he would have because it's so um i mean he he did he did have fights with the saxons and he had meetings with the saxons but obviously we know that even in day, you know these times uh, just because two leaders meet doesn't mean that they know the same language they have interpreters you know so um considering the size of anglo-saxon and considering it being such a, a new uh, thing to britain it's you know like say if you look up that map unfortunately it's you know not here to to point to but it's only a very small section at the um at the southeast of England, at that point that they're controlling. So would Arthur have been able to speak all those different languages around? Probably not. He'd probably have interpreters to, to talk to those people. I've lost Luke. No, no. <laughs> I'm back. Oh, right. I, don't know, I don't know what happened. We'll have to edit that bit out. I don't know what happened then. Yeah, you're talk, talking about, we, we, you were talking about the little area of oh, right. yeah. southeast uh, England. Yeah. So the, Saxons are, you know, they only control a tiny southeast area, which is considered a colony of the Welsh, you know, kingdom. So um, would Arthur have known how to talk to all those different colonies with their individual languages? Because there was a tiny section of Vandals as well, you know, from the little known Vandal invasion. Oh, you're getting a lot of calls, it seems. Uh, I, I don't know what's happening in a minute. We'll, we'll just have to um, 
Well, that bit out. Talk, talk, talk again. I don't know what the, the, this is. Yeah, go and talk again. Where, where was it? Where did you hear from? <laughs> Definitely gonna have to this bit out. Right. So back to southeast England. Carry on. Right. So the southeast of England, if you look at, so go to Google, take a, find the map. It's called Britain in 570. And you'll see that there's a giant portion of England, like most of England is, is the Welsh kingdom. And mm. right in the southeast corner, you've got this tiny bit called Engel and just below it, a tiny bit called Saxon. You know, so these are just considered to be two pieces of, you know, of the, the colonies of, of Arthur's kingdom at the time. Well, technically he wasn't actually king because Myrig survived for a very long time. So Arthur was actually a prince for most of this time. But would he have known how to speak all the individual languages of those colonies? Or would he have had an interpreter for when he goes over to to speak with the generals and stuff over there? Yeah, you know, this is a really good point. And, and, and um the other, the other thing I'd like to mention here, which is a bit of a sort of, uh, I don't know if it's a red herring, but but one one thing that I I always say is this nonsense about uh, uh, Tyluris and Demite and all these names that seem to be invented by the Romans, right? There, these names seem to come later into history as sort of names for areas or or name people. Right. The one thing is that you are dead right in what you say. If that's sort of a Roman interpretation, but um, what we, what I would say, is that there would be more than just one type of um, language, one more than one type of Cymraic. It might be written very similarly in Cornwall as it's written in Cumbria or or Wales or wherever. Right. But when you're having conversations with people, it would be very, very different. For example, well, I, I've got a bit, I've got a, if that sorry. change the across Wales though is a result of obviously during the 1800s the the British government went around replacing all the the teachers in Wales with English teachers didn't they because they they wanted to basically suppress the language so I wonder if that is something that's birthed from people trying to eradicate the Welsh language so much that it's almost been you know divided to be hidden you know in small communities where they continue speaking it uh, and it's in that sense it's you know diverted because it's not been used so nationally so so this is a really interesting question again for another day um what you're saying is the the phenomenon where in britain you've got different types of english dialects that people can't bloody understand i got a relative that that um well i got a, a brother-in-law who's, who's like um who's middlesbrough half that can't understand the word he's saying he's speaking english like, yeah um is it is it a British phenomenon that that we languages that sound really different uh, when it's the same language in Europe? When you go to me, can somebody in Bavaria have a perfect conversation with somebody uh, from? Well, South that, of course, that's why you see Arnold Schwarzenegger's accent as opposed to the usual Austrian. You know, like yeah, yeah, it's so, because. Just, just like in America, you have your, your redneck areas. Well, not that I shouldn't say that. Your southern areas with your, your accent and, and your northern areas, which sound completely different. But like you say, they're still uh, understandable to us, aren't they? You wouldn't hear a southern American and think, you know, that's a completely different language. But, you know, you could go somewhere like, I don't know, Newcastle and think, what the hell's going on here? I, 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 can't, I can't really understand anyone from North Wales. <laughs> But I think, again, though, like uh, with Welsh, it is such a complicated language that's been suppressed. So people in their individual yes. cities, you know, it's only just now that you're starting to get like the old names back for places like, you know, Snowdon and stuff. So at, the, at that point, I think when you localise, that's where you get those divisions. Because if you look at language across Britain um, in terms of like, look at electronic language, for example, everyone uses the same words, right? A new word comes out within a week. Everyone's saying it, aren't they? Right. So yes. in our connectivity has allowed our language to become uh, more globalized and we, we adapt these terms much faster. Whereas without that connection, when you're separated, obviously each individual area comes up with its own words, its own sayings, its own things. So I think this is just a result of division. Yeah, uh, it, it, it might be. Uh, that's a really interesting thing. So back to the question, we don't, um, King Arthur would have spoken any kind of Latin. He, he, may, I, have, I, he may have understood stood some words but not well, speaking it Saxon, which I, I didn't just thought about is we've got to consider that if the welsh was the dominating la uh, kingdom in this period you know if you were one from one of the smaller colonies 
when you are going to speak to the Welsh, it'd probably be custom for you to be the one to speak their language, considering they're the one in charge. Um, in other words, when when you go to when you go to Spain, you expect everybody to speak English. Is that what we're saying? Well, no, no, I'm saying <laughs> no, no. In, in, in a way, no, in a way, this is our attitude. When we go to Spain, we expect everybody to be able to but, speak well, English. Yeah. We don't. If you're going to sit in the emperor's chamber, you want to, you know, speak the language he's going to understand. You don't want to offend him, that kind of thing. If it's possibly going to be the same in same for these colonies, you know, if you're going to go speak to Arthur, you better be ready to speak Welsh. You'll cut your tongue out. <laughs> oh, OK. So in other words, we're, we're restricting what King Arthur might have been speaking now. Um, well, because- He's the one in charge, isn't he? So he's the one that should be expecting other people to tell, you know, to tell him what they want to say. He's, you know, I'm in charge. I can speak to me in my language. So the thing is, this, this, now we're, we're going into the nitty gritty, Germanic, Germanic runes, Germanic, right? So what we're starting to see is, is, is runic um, slowly so what, what, being used. Go on. What period is this from that we're seeing now? Uh, this runic is this runic's a little bit later. We're, we're talking about sort of six sevens rather than before. But then again, the script itself is going to be very similar to one or two runic scribbles on some of our stones. So what we're saying, we're, we're talking about Ogham and runic appearing on some stones at the same time. Right. Um, and all of this is roughly four or five and where we're getting some runic being used. Obviously, um, this sort of runic script is, it, some people are, there, it's even 200s. So, you know, it's thinking, well, hang on a minute, the Roman Empire is still thriving. Um, yeah, it, do, it does look very simple, doesn't it, the language? It does, it, it, but, it, but it's, it's well formed though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I'm just, uh, that's it's my first time seeing this image, so I'm just trying to really... Yeah, it, my- it, it, is, it, is a, it is a really nice image. And, and one, one of the... One of the things we're talking about is is like this runic type thing. You always think runic is is definitely um, Scandinavian. However, when we're when we're talking about, for example, um, again another lecture, the Anna Nurbe, published by Heinrich Himmel on the first of July, um, nineteen thirty five. Um, what they what they did the forgeries um, to sort of say that the pure Aryan race exists and all the rest of it had some right. some runes on it and they were saying oh obviously runes are like a, a German invention from like you know yeah. hundreds of years before they were meant to be invented so so yeah. it's like a Germanic then Scandinavian script um, well that's uh, just yeah it's very interesting that you'd bring that up because uh with the Aryan bit because there's um obviously there's a lot of history around Aryans with uh you know um the event that nobody wants to bring up um and the thing is is when you when you have this Aryans coming down um because i i do believe that you know the Aryans were something that was in europe because if you if you go down to you know you've got the indo Aryans uh you know around india and stuff like that so the Aryans were and if you're saying that they were they would have been using germanic runes where so i assume they would have been moving with like the vandals and stuff like that yeah Right. So what's interesting is it is around King Arthur's reign. I think this is uh, yeah, this is King Arthur one when he's in uh, when he's in Gaul. There are some yeah. there's a report of vandals coming down there and having fights with the Romans and King Arthur sees them off and and they flee through Spain. So if you're thinking that these are areas, what it says in the history is that they flee through Spain and they cross over the pillars of Hercules and they go into North Africa where the Roman Empire had used to have control, you know, over the north uh, northern bits of uh, of Africa on the Mediterranean. And they settled in Carthage. Now, if they're Aryans, what did that area become called? Well, Barbaria. So they were the Barbarians. Now, there's actually a lot of ideology around this that they might have been Muslim, which would actually come from the Baba bit. The Baba meaning father, father Aryans. Which so, is which is even which is even stranger in itself. <laughs> uh, yeah, you. you so, yeah, I like I love the word you use, bar, uh, and and you've got the yeah, then you've eventually got the idea of the Barbary pirates, uh, and 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 then the yeah, I, I, like, I like what we're flowing there. So so are we well, saying that King actually, Arthur would have heard? Go on. I was just saying it raises the question that it's completely off the point. It just raises the question that these vandals were would have been actually speaking perhaps some form of Arabic 
because if they were Muslim and they, because that's how the north of, of, of Africa has possibly received some of its Islam instead of coming from the Middle East, like you'd expect. But is, Islam didn't hit us until um, um, Mecher in um, 6th to 6th, 20s. Are we, are we, are we, are we, well, been, well, are we going into this idea yeah. that the denting stuff wrong? Uh, that, yeah. that, that sort of, yeah. I mean, there's lots of ideas, like you say, that Christianity was actually birthed in Britain. And it, so if that was the case, it wouldn't be too far to assume that Islam also was birthed not too far away. Because if all those stories took place over there, then perhaps all these stories took place over here as well. Do you know what I mean? You can't just move one and say, OK, so actually Bible stories took place here, but Islam's still over there. And and it makes yeah. sense. But when you look at uh, if you look at the empire, right? Rome would have been controlling, uh, at that point, Rome is controlling the north of Africa and it's it's fallen. So they would have been, you know, Roman religions, Greek religions. And at that point, they've all turned Muslim as the Barbarians have taken over. And uh, that's, again, well, if you go into the Tartarians, Tartarians, who were Muslim. So, and that's, you know, Genghis Khan, all, they were Muslim. So the Tartarians and the Barbarians are the same people, same as the Hungarians. It's they and the Bulgarians. The Bulgarians come from the Kingdom of Bulga, which is off the the Volga River in Russia. And uh, when they got moved out of there, they they went down to Europe and made Bulgarians. So you've got all these different Aryans coming from the same area. So if Tartarians were Muslim, that that suggests that the Vandals would have possibly been Muslim too. Oh my God, that's that's blowing my head. It really is. <laughs> but you, but look, look, do you know do you know what? Right, we need to <laughs> blow our minds. We need to blow our minds next, Paul Bren. Um, so, <laughs> oh, hang on. Where, where's our Paul Bren image? Oh, it's disappeared. Um, we got oh, lost. Though. He he did actually disappear for a moment. Then, oh, this guy. Do so we the, win? The, the do we win? Scripts that you think that he invented. Yeah, Dewey win Ir Ivion. Now he, he lived between um the 1780s and the 1840s, 1841 actually. Now, no, no, you're putting words in my mouth. I didn't <laughs> I, I don't complete you you want to. Yeah, um, I don't I I'm saying I'm not saying for one minute that the Colbrin script is invented, but I, I like the idea that that Colbren looks very, very similar to Etruscan. Now we do know the Etruscan language become extinct, um, coming into uh, the two hundreds, one fifties BC. Right, the, the the Romans absolutely hated the Etruscans, and I will say that one of the biggest loves I've got in life um, is not is not only my pet turkey Baldric, but I love the Etruscans. I, right. I absolutely. I absolutely love the Etruscans, right? And I, I you know, Baldrick's probably listening because he knows I love him. Baldrick, I love you, in you. Yeah, he's out there somewhere. So, um, a bit of madness in this. Video. But the thing is, I don't want to say too much about. Um, I don't want to say too much about the current script, but I would like to say that um, many people within the world of archaeology um, think that Colbrain is completely invented. What would you say to that? And and therefore, is it possible that Colbren would have been language familiar to King Arthur? Would he would he have spoken Colbren, or is Colbren a written form of uh, Camarag? What, what's going on there? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? That um, you if you if you use Colbren, if if you're decoding it, you'd want to use well, truly old Camarag. That's how you're going to get one of the most accurate representations of what it's saying, isn't it? So that yeah. that would indicate that that's coming from the same period. Now, there was one thing that I, it's a diversion that I want to bring up, which is, uh, but we'll come back to it, which is the hieroglyphs. So make sure you remind me about the Cumroglyphics hieroglyphics stuff, because oh, that- I hope I'll have, hopefully I'll have forgotten when, when we get to the end. <laughs> well, that, that's an important piece of the puzzle that you don't want to miss off. Okay. But, um, so, oh, yeah, I mean, I'm more than happy to, to accept it's a fabrication, but the thing is, we do have quite a few- We're not saying there is. We see- We're saying, uh, we're like, saying it could be. I think Jim Michael uh, reported over a hundred different finds in America of, you know, coal burning caves inscribed on sides of forts, you know, Native Americans using it on sticks. There's coal burn all over America. So if it is a, a falsification, this is a falsification that's gone, you know, gone quite deep. We've also got the St. Paul's Cathedral Stone, which was discovered, as you can imagine, under St. Paul's. If you look that up, that is a, a stone with a Welsh dragon on it, and it has Colburn writing on the bottom that says, nobody knew what a dragon looked like. 
So, yeah, and that that was found in, I don't have the date here, but I believe it was 1850, but it was when they were doing some work on St. Paul's. But if you look up St. Paul's Cathedral Stone with Colburn, you'll find it easily. A beautiful Welsh dragon on a stone saying, you know, nobody knew what a dragon looked like, which obviously must be referencing the comet because dragon Welsh means lightning stones, you know? Ah, uh, yes, yes, that one, yeah. I, I, you, you've, you've actually done a recording on this, haven't you? Um, I don't think so, haven't I? Not yet. Oh, may, may, maybe, maybe we should. What we should do is we should talk about um, but, mass annihilation of the human population. And that, that, that would be good. But that's uh, another thing. Carry on. Things for people to look up so they can make up their own mind. There's also a 10 metre shroud with Etruscan wrapped around it in Zagreb. Um, so, and you can also find one of the copper scroll, scrolls that were found at Qumran, apparently had Colburn writing on as well. And then, as, of course, look up the baked clay tablets at the Assyrian city of Nineveh. So there's just some examples, you know, for people to look up if they want to go and make up their own mind. And there's also a brilliant channel um, run by a woman called Marshalla Abrahams on, uh, on YouTube that you can go and see uh, her talking about Colburn. And, you know, it's, it's quite extensive. So... That's something that you'll want to do entire videos on. <laughs> but yeah, carry on. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I want you to carry on. So, so, so basically, oh, okay, okay. Um, I, I've, I've fudged the issue. Do I, what do I think about Colbrand? Um, I, I feel, I feel personally that um, we've been, the past two years in particular, um, because of uh, Roth Broadstock's work and, um, um, hidden Britain, Britain's yeah. hidden in history. Um, it's almost as if it's like, right, you know, we 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 know uh, Colbren and these scripts are are all linked from ancient time and so on. Um, and when you think uh, old scripts, you need to come back to the archaeological bias, i.e. Nobody wrote anything down in Britain before the Roman era, which I think is absolute poppycock. So well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, yeah. The Welsh, why would the Welsh be unable to write? Exactly. Therefore, there must be an enterprising offshoot to understand that there must have been some of the script that, that is hitherto not really well known, i.e. could be seen to be these coal brand letters. So that's accepting something. Would say two things, that we've got carved wood, wooden sort of totem that have been found up near Mardi in Wales. They were found a few years ago. They, they, they are, they, and they've got all these markings on them, right? So these date to over uh, 5,000 years ago. So what is actually that writing? What is that language portraying? So that's a really good question. Um, another that is actually in one of my other lectures, I'll, I'll just do this quick. When I went to Mice House this one day with a group of students, as I'm leaving, the, the tour guide says, oh, I, I've got something I want to show you, right? Um, and she showed me some carvings. She said, those carvings there, not runic, they're, they're, they're Neolithic. What do those carvings mean? And they look like they could be a form of writing. So therefore, by this, this is, going to be my revelation today right by ignoring a writing form like Colbrin, whether you think it's invented or but by by ignoring it you're really insulting our ancestors because i will say this there was a written form in britain before the roman era i said i believe that that has to be and we've got enough evidence out there, which is a bit vague, but we've got enough evidence out there to say that there is something written down. Lots of these characters like this. Well, then, all you have is the, yeah. you know, thing to, again, going back to like Alan Wilson's uh, history, you know, he says there was a migration in uh, by Albine to Britain in about 1500 to, you know, 1350 BC. That's the first one. And then the second one is the Brutus migration after Troy fell, which I think Troy was around 650 BC, wasn't it? And that's that's apparently when we have the tribes of Israel coming over. So the idea that these uh, Syrians that have come over from, and obviously that's why Surrey is called Surrey from Syria, Syria. Um, the idea that they, for 1500 years, have just not written anything down and they've you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Like they've managed, right? They've managed to build boats capable of getting them from Assyria to Britain, but they don't know how to write. 
there, there, just, there is one there, there is one simple answer to this and that is in absence of evidence right so I'll, I'll tell you i'll tell you about the absent in absence of evidence from an archaeological point of view and then uh what what i will say is how we this in writing so in absence of evidence you've got an you, you've got an empty field right uh, and there's a tree in the middle right this this big tall tree in the middle of the field right there's nothing else around this 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 tree right but this tall tree right is a thousand years old right and you're thinking well hang on a minute somebody then comes around and says oh um this had always been agricultural land there's nothing been on this land other than that one tree for the past two thousand years absolute nonsense because that tree represents the last tree of a woodland because the reason why that tree is really tall is because it was surrounded by other trees that were really tall. It's like they removed all those other trees and they left the one tree in the middle. That's called in the absence of evidence. So one bit of evidence proving that there was a woodland there because of the old tree, right? Okay, so yeah. in, ab in absence of evidence, sorry, in absence of evidence, um, it could have been that people were actually writing on material that would decay. Right. And oh, therefore, well, that's why we don't get the evidence. Pe then, people in Native America. Right. This is this is a this is a point. Right. You've spoken a lot about Native Americans. Let, I'm going to say something about Native America. Native America, for example, they Native Americans wrote on totems. They carved on totems. They didn't they didn't mainly carve on. They didn't really carve on. They carved in wood. Right. We know that those totems existed. But if you buried all those to totems and they rotted away, you could say that these Native Americans had no way of communication. Exactly. But they exactly. did. But they did. Exactly, Luke. Well, is you know this now we'll bring up the the hieroglyphs. So obviously, going back to Ross Broadstock and uh, Alan Wilson first realizing that they could decode the Egyptian hieroglyphs with the Welsh language, which obviously brings up two two huge conclusions either way one of them is the obvious the biggest is that the egyptians were speaking some kind of welsh when they wrote those hieroglyphs because how else would how else would that happen they must have been and this by the is, way this isn't hieroglyphs this is ogham that i'm on the screen not to confuse people carry on but yeah so when you've got hieroglyphs and you you know you're using the the welsh root words these this is you know modern welsh language you can use to do this easily and figure out exactly what those Egyptians were saying. So now you have a, a lot of issues coming up because ancient Egypt in some in some texts, you know, is going back thousands and thousands of years. You know, some would yeah. suggest that pyramids are made 10,000 years ago, that kind of thing. That What would we be looking at? A language that hasn't changed in 10,000 years? There is an even weirder alternative, which is that the hieroglyph is faked using the Welsh language as a, as a starting point. Uh, which is what Fomenko would suggest. So that's an entirely different world to go down, which is extremely interesting. It offers up the idea that if the events of the Bible did happen in Britain, then perhaps the location of old ancient Egypt was also a lot closer. Perhaps it was in Europe, perhaps it was in Britain itself. And we've basically manufactured the, the hieroglyphs into ancient Egypt to kind of move the story and, and dilute you know, the waters a bit. That is... Another theory to that, that, again, if you want to hear more about that, you want to read one of Fomenko's books. It goes very deep into that kind of thing. But uh, is, is that is that your hieroglyphics point? Yeah, yeah. You want me to explain that Welsh Welsh decodes the hieroglyphs, and that offers up, uh, you know, two two realistic opportunities, conclusions, which are one hieroglyphs are faked using the Welsh language, which sounds quite reasonable, or the Egyptians were speaking Welsh in its present form as it is today, thousands of years ago. Uh, that, that revelation. But, but that, think about it. that means the Welsh language hasn't changed in thousands of years since the ancient Egyptians sat there carving it onto their walls, or it was used to fake the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Two, that's two options you can pick, but either one's weird, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it, it definitely is weird. And um, okay. <laughs> You know what we've got to do, Luke, is is as we the 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 end um, soon. Um, I, I would like to mention Ogham. Now, um, Ogham, Ogham is is Ogham 
a written language. The answer is yes. Ogham's around in, in the late 300s, 400s. Um, is Ogham um, an early form of written Welsh? Some say maybe it is. You do see Ogham on stones that you've got other text and eventually people chuck in runic on it, right? So you might actually have a stone that, that seemingly can be translated into different languages, right? What is Ogham trying to tell us? And one thing I one thing I actually say, and, and this is my curveball, right? Right. This is this is my curveball, right? Um, you've actually been talking about it a lot, but um, or have you? An extinct language. Well, some people believe yes, there, there could have been another language which is extinct. Yeah, right. Yeah. And and that is the curveball. Uh, and well, that's you know, the I have I have thought. What if Coleridge's more the red herring? Get everyone focused on that one. You don't focus on the real one. You know. Yes, and and the real one to me is Ogham, and but, I, I I'm quite passionate about Ogham. Not many people speak about Ogham. I would love. Um, to Sorry, before you do, can I just because I, I I know very little about Ogham, but what I do know is just interesting to a point I made earlier, which is obviously if you go by Wikipedia, it says that it's you know of an early Irish script, right? As you know, there's a yeah. lot of connect- yeah, there's lots of connections between you know Irish and and the Gypsy. I don't want to offend anyone, but the where the, this is where it's coming from is again the Tartaria thing. Because if you go into the you know the Aryan, the Tartar Aryans, etc., um it's going to Tartar history and, and the Bible, you'll have heard of Gog Magog. And again, in Welsh history, the giant Gog Magog that was supposedly killed by Brutus. Well, Gog and Magog uh, on maps will show as being uh, somewhere near China where in old, old maps before they got wiped off completely. And it's a place called Tenduk, where a guy called Prester John apparently oppressed people. So the interesting thing about this that I'm bringing it up is obviously Gog and Magog sounds like Og, whom you'd expect the Gogs to maybe speak some kind of Gogum or something. And they have their, their connection to Ireland. Now, what's even more interesting, as you can imagine from Aryans, you know, the Iron Cross from the, uh, from the Germans and the swash sticker. Well, right here is, uh, I brought this up earlier. There's, I can send it to you. There's a stone in Ireland, a very old stone inscribed with the I, big German Iron Cross looking thing and swash stickers below it. So if that's connected to Aryans and Ogham is connected to Irish, you, and the gypsies, which are Tartarians, you're seeing this connection. I think the the language you're talking about might have been this tar- this language of the Aryans. Um, so, so I don't know where the, the, we get nightmarish red-headed women, but it sounds like we 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 get them from Ireland, Ireland and probably Tartaria at the same time. Um, but but I would like to, I would like to say that I'm I'm gypsy lineage as well. <laughs> I was just going to say, the, if you go to America, the, again, the stories of the white ginger uh, Native Americans. And then if you go to Peru, you can find white ginger mummies. Same in Egypt, mm. white ginger mummies. Some of the, in fact, some of the mummies in Egypt have been found with blonde, had blonde hair and blue eyes. So yeah. I'm, these name connections, you know, Og, Gog, Ogham, the, the Irish and the Tartars, because I remember reading a, a book about which had a tweet was talking about the Irish fighting a war in the east. So what that means, and they said uh, this Irish soldier said, "Sir, I've caught a Tartar," which I don't remember Ireland fighting any wars in the east, which would suggest there was Tartars around Ireland. Uh, that that that's, that's quite amazing. Um, that is really amazing. It, it's that I think. So this. Um, um, I, Ogham might Go be connected to, like, to, what, to this Tartaria, so I'd love to hear more from you now about Ogham. Um, well, the, the, one, the, one, the one thing the Ogham's written is it's always, for example, there's three lines of text on here. So basically, uh, there's one line of text on the left hand side. There's one line of text going through the middle, and there's one line of text on the right hand side. So basically, Ogham. Ogham is based of, around a line of, so basically you've got a line and uh, you've either got a diagonal or you've got one broken line that doesn't go over the line or you've got a line that goes through the line and each of those lines make up individual characters. Now, 
But the one the one intriguing thing about Ogham, it suddenly appears, Luke, yeah. and then it suddenly disappears. Right. It it appears and it suddenly disappears. This is this is the strange thing about Ogham. So if we want to say that Ogham existed vaguely, um, and we see we vaguely right. Ogham existed in the 300s and it runs all the way, say, into like the four five hundreds, it becomes extinct quite quickly. How does it become extinct? Because the one point to be said, Luke, is that little lines on a stone, people are starting to look at cave art in places like Lascaux and they're seeing little little lines or a little dot. Well, for example, the, 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 Mayan, the Mayan text, for example, uh, when, when, you, when you, actually not the text, numeric form of Maya is a dot represents one, a line represents five, right? It's a line, it's a line, the line being used to represent lots of things in history. You, you mentioned you mentioned earlier on about Latin, um, the line being used to create characters in Latin. For example, I, um, you, you're thinking R and, and, and for example, V, right? You are very, very right, but it is a line. But this itself it is a line within a line. It's a small but very effective way of communication. And... When we think about toll brand, they, you, you, you think about, OK, people listening and watching this thinking about, oh, well, is toll brand real? Is it not? I'm completely discount, discount it. Uh, but or, or I'm going to agree that it existed. But there's one thing um, about that language invented in the 1920s and 30s, which has got a million um, using it and speaking it in Europe. You remember what that is? Pardon, what was that? But, there's a language that was invented in the 1920s and 30s, an international language. French. <laughs> nope. Yeah, no, nope. nope. a million yeah. people speak it in the world, right? A million people speak it in the world. Um, um, he resurrected the one. Yeah, Hebrew, is it? Or no, 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 no. So if you if you if you type if you type it in now, this is a point. This this is very similar about Ogham, right? So, in other words, what what they did so um, in international language right if you type in the international language have you have you remember yet but have you remember what language that is no no sorry i'm just rolling at the moment <laughs> Go, just carry on right so international language something called the international language institute right um and to, to be um there, there, there was a language in, invented in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and it basically had an element of French, an element of German, an element of, of everything in it, right? And, and basically, um, one million people speak it on the planet today. But it, it's, it's an international language, right? And that's a little bit for your research. I'm not going to give you the name. That's, the, that's a little bit for the, your research. But the fact... Go on. I was just thinking with the, the Germanic thing that you said, um, I was actually, you know, I was looking at this encyclopedia from 1865 and then, you know, and I noticed that Germany is, you know, is a series of duchies and kingdoms and stuff. Uh, and there's so many different ones. You're like, how the hell was there even a Germanic language? These guys didn't even unify until the night, until 1920, was it? Or, well, 1918 after the first world war. And you're like, it's a bit strange, isn't it? Like, you know, that they all contain the same Germanic language instead of having their own, their own independent ones like we see in England. Well, th th this is the point. Th this this is the point. What The point that you made earlier on was, um, was there, um, you know, is this a phenomenon in Britain that we've, that we've got loads of different sort of dialectical things and nobody can understand each other? And in Germany... You've got all these, the Saxony, Bavaria, um, you, you've got Prussia, right? All these different individual kingdoms, but they all spoke the same language, right? And they were all able to go to war and they were all able to do extremely well uh, against the French um, in 1870, 1871. Uh, the Germans did extremely well in the First World War until the armistice. Um, and, uh, the Second World War, well, we know what happened to the Second World War, but the fact of the matter is it all tenderly the same language and they had the same type of identity in britain so prussians identified themselves with bavarians bavarians identified themselves with with um, people from saxony 
you wouldn't get the same as a Welshman identifying themselves with a Scot or and it's very odd. Well, uh, I, okay, I'll get, I'll get I, to tell you Esper, Esperanto. Remember Esperanto? No. You've never heard of Esperanto, right? You, I didn't want to tell you Esperanto. Look at Esperanto, 1920s. It, it was an opportunity. What people thought they, they wanted this, there was this idea of the world order. And what they did, they took, they took words from all different languages um, and they invented a new language. There's a million people speak Esperanto today. And, and the clue to maybe understanding Ogham is, is Esperanto. It's almost as if Ogham seems to happen and it disappears. Or then again, did just happen? Was it was it an evolution? Some people wanted to communicate, and and it was Ogham is an expression of that communication, a simple expression of that communication, far away from your Gilbreds, far away from your Latin, far away from your Welsh, far away from your Saxon. And to be honest with you, a load of laws on a stone is a lot more easier than any of those. Well, what I was one thing I would note is that it says here that you know it was from the fourth to sixth centuries AD, and then it's disappeared. Well. What do we know? Well, what do we think happened in the sixth century? That comet, five sixty-two AD. Uh, yeah, I, I don't like people using sixths and fifths, be, um, and then then you honed it in into five. five. Uh, obviously, Justinian, the, the Emperor Justinian, explains that there was a plague across Europe. Then again, something mass happened, and to be honest with you, well, when we've got the Krakatoa. Go they said a thirty-five ma- Krakatoa eruption. But that obviously um, didn't affect any of the areas near to it in the same way that it affected us. Um, according to the records of the, uh, the Welsh, I was, again, I was watching this today. Um, according to the Native Americans over in, um, over in America, when, when Arthur landed there, they, they were talking about it being you know, fine in North America. They were, they were sweet. They were dandy. Apparently, there have been tsunamis and stuff like to to bring him over there, but they'd have essentially been fine. But they were talking of Europe as being completely destroyed. But again, that, according to their records, that's actually 1170 that that's happened, not 570, whereas the dendrochronology data would suggest that all the trees died off 1,500 years ago. So the, the datings are all wrong. Uh, well, the thing is, this, this is a, that's another lecture. That would be a really good lecture, actually, about, about the dates be a really good one um so i mean I'm how, pretty how many, on the, i don't mind bringing all that stuff like i've got a, a hell of a lot of stuff on uh, anglo-saxon poetry for example mentions of it by gildas um there was there was someone else i'm forgetting um but yeah there's i've got i've got a lot of documentation for for the comet for 562 from the british point of view that that that, that you know about some all the rest of it that that sounds really good bringing that comet stuff in um but yeah no but but to, just to recap um again what language did king arthur speak well if it was if it was king arthur in cornwall associated with tintagel may i be burnt at the stake um uh, in cornwall there would have been there would have been rushing around sort of with a bit of organ right so we've got a bit of influence from ireland um well- any leader, any, yeah, go on. Cornwall is that uh, according to these records, because you can actually find a place in Cornwall called Mara Zion, which uh, means bitter Zion. And the reason for that is because apparently there was already Israelites in Cornwall when the uh, when the tribes of Israel came over and they told them of the, the fall of Israel and they named the landing spot Mara Zion because they were bitter about Zion. And it actually, I, I do remember that there was another thing about when those Israelites turned up, the whoever was in control of Britain at that point, so I presume it would have been some descendants of uh, Albine, they they recognised the Israelites and allowed them to have Cornwall. So you, you, you don't know. They oh, might my have, God. Yeah. So basically, we could, have been, we could have been looking at them speaking Welsh even in Cornwall with some kind of heat <laughs> mixed in there. So, so the very interesting thing is, is that we we've obviously got sort of a king and a King Arthur, King of Cornwall, and that there's lots of evidence for that. But that's another thing. So obviously, the king, a King Arthur in Cornwall, that sort of say that he would have spoken um, um, an, an old Welsh type of dialect and um, some Irish influence. You mentioned about them. That 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 does actually make a little bit of sense. And Arthur um, too. But- 
explicitly he had a campaign where he went over to Ireland to um I, I'm pretty certain it was vandals I might be wrong on this but he he, he had a campaign in Ireland where he went across quelling uh, quelling people there that were supposed to be like Viking barbarian types or oh, but yeah. Or even Barbary pirates. Um, well, maybe they're the ones. Yeah. That, they're the ones that have brought the Ogham over, and he's gone over like, right, let's go sort these Ogham's out. Oh my God! Yeah, that really interesting there, and and the um and we we are running, running sort of against the time now, but Somerset. What what about our um, King Arthur of Somerset? Well, um, that's, that's the I, my personal belief is Somerset is um, part of the Geoffrey of Monmouth, uh, you know, fictionalization of King Arthur. Uh, I think they the Somerset version was done to kind of give this um, this link to the kings of Britain, which were obviously Anglo-Saxon at that point, and they were trying to falsify history. But obviously, I don't know. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, Geoffrey Ash is convinced of it, but I, I think lots of people will burn me at the stake well, I'm, 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 even uh, mention. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, we got a bit of delay talking at the same time. But I was going to say, I'm pretty certain Glastonbury hadn't even been founded at this point. Mm, oh, God, that's one of my other lectures. We, we've got substantial evidence to say that uh, we, we, we've got um, Iron Age um, and Roman era material there. And obviously, there's no reason why that couldn't have just continued into a settlement in the early medieval period. But again, Funny. The whole theory that the giants that controlled Britain before there's so there's so many references to a race of giants that even even Welsh folklore says that uh, giants used to control Britain and in fact the uh, <laughs> the oldest myths I can't remember I think this actually comes from Chaldean says that it was a giant called Albion whose body actually makes up Britain and that's why it was called Albany. Well, bloody hell, the planet must be quite small then. Um... <laughs> but then again, bring in the giants of like Gog Magog. You've got the story of Gog Magog, which is, you know, the, the last giant in Britain who is apparently slayed by Brutus. Um, and yeah, it, it all goes together. In fact, if you read the, I think it is the Anglo-Saxon poetry to do with the 562 comment, there, uh, comment, there is a, a sentence that says the work of giants lays in ruin. And uh, and then you you know you can see the giants' causeway in Ireland, even our two pound coins standing on the shoulders of giants. And all, all, all to that bloody comet in the um, uh, five forties, if it what have, what you know, it's all all linked. All it, linked. Is, it really is all linked because again, look at what uh, England means, right? Engel is is obviously angel. It's the you know the e from the a, which is uh, the same from Allah to L as in. L in the Christian as opposed to the Al from from Muslim so it's that same change it's literally angel land land of the angels and if you go to the bible the angels supposedly uh fancied the daughters of men and created the race of Nephilim who were giants or you know demigods and they an angel land England land of the angels we're loving it we're loving it um <laughs> so a king, a king, a King Arthur in in in, in Somerset. You're not you're not seeing it, but if 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 I saw it, um, yeah, I, if I go with the Jeffrey I, Ashton, I think that that's just his stories, King Arthur two stories, moved because he would have he would have been having battles around it. He owned all these areas. I think they've just kind of made an Englisher version, like an Anglicized version of King Arthur. But again, like you said, it was a popular name. There's you know maybe someone did decide, fuck it, I'm Arthur. <laughs> you know. Let, let's let's go with the let's go with the curveball of these images. Hang on a minute. Um, Essex. Um, the Essex to people in Colchester, Camel and um, Camelot. Um, it, it's it, it's it's the Essex Arth, right? Nobody ever talks about the Essex Arthur. Nobody ever does it. But interesting enough. If there is a king through in, I, I know uh, Monica Escobar and I was going to be throwing daggers at me, but um, we've got to, we've got to sort of name check her. We've got to. Um, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the one the one the one thing uh, about X is that whenever people talk about King Arthur, they're obsessed with either Wales or Cornwall. Um, you know, that's with Somerset, but nobody ever mentions the other King Arthurs, and it's a very popular name. But if there's a King Arthur in Essex, 
Um, you might think that he's very much, that there's a Germanic tongue there, there's a Saxon tongue. Maybe uh, Cymru is, 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 is a slowly extinct language with him. But I would say that, and the other, the thing is that we didn't say with Ogham, right? It's a very interesting thing with Ogham. Ogham itself almost seems to occur on stones. Um, and, and there's a point to be made there. Um, when you look at writing, certain languages are written on certain materials, right? Yeah. Because of what they are. So hieroglyphics has a tendency to be written on stone, right? You, you don't get as many hieroglyphics on, on, on papyrus, papyrus, for example. Yeah. You, you, you see cursive writing on, on papyrus rather than sort of hieroglyphics. So in other words, you certain writing being used for certain things, right? Ogham primarily, I, I can't, I don't know any Ogham on anything else other than the stone. So that's a really, really good point. Writings on certain things, but does that get as close to the language? And finally, finally, the last image, last but not least, um, there. What? Hey, what, what, the, the, the black hole of Calcutta, but there we go, we've got Wales. Well, hey, what, one thing I was going to bring up about the, the Arthur being in different positions, and this is something that Fomenko talks about. Um, so when you have what you consider falsifications of history, you have two types. You obviously have the one that's done purposely, uh, where, you know, when you decide, right, we've just genocided this people, and now we're going to make up that we didn't do it. You know, that's your falsification. But you also have natural falsification. So, for example, let's say we did survive a disaster. Say we lived in Ireland originally, and we had to move from Ireland to Britain, and we had some events that happened in Ireland. Let's say we had a King Arthur in Ireland and, you know, a Camelot or whatever. When we get over to England, as we see when people move, they like to name places after places that they used to be in you know new england or you know stuff like that they like to name these places the same thing so as they move to this place and they name their places they start telling their children their stories and they say oh well there was this king arthur and he was at camelot and eventually through time that camelot moves to the new camelot and people start going oh yeah well there was a king arthur and he was in camelot there when really king arthur was in camelot over in ireland but these people have moved so you don't know maybe the essex are people that have survived the comet and have come back and they're now living over in essex and they're telling the story of king arthur but it's it's migrated to where they live instead of staying where it's truly from a, a legend migrating and i really loved it and finally we're, we're, we're more or less at the end of, the, of this presentation today um, the King Arthur of of Cymru, Wales, um, definitely speaking uh, Cymru. Um, I tell you what, very aware of Ogham as well. Not do it justice. This this map does not do it justice. You it, you need to get that map of Britain in five seventy up so you can see the Kingdom of Wales covering the whole thing, pretty much. Yeah, I I I know the one you mean. I, I, yeah. I do know it. Yeah. It, Old Gaul as well. Gaul was a colony of Britain. That's where we have Brittany. Uh, and, Brittany, you know. yeah. Brittany. So, so sort of my my conclusion on this is that that um, uh, though I think we agree that sort of this 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 Camraig is is something that um, King Arthur would have spoken. Yeah. Um, obviously, Ogham. We haven't really identified what Ogham is. Is it another language? So. Ogham is to be found in West Wales, is to be found over other parts of South Wales and a bit in North as well. It would have been something familiar to a King Arthur figure. Um, so Ogham, is it a different language? What's going on? Um, King Arthur, I'm, I think, may have been fluent in several different languages. That's my conclusion. The different King Arthurs over time anyway. Luke? Yep, I'd say I, I agree. Uh, I would put the, the alternative... Don't agree. Oh, OK. Well, I'll put the alternative that perhaps King Arthur was was more of a general, you know, and he was uh, he was a warlord himself and he would have had interpreters speaking these languages for him, you know, because we like to have this image of, you know, these kings being very extremely intelligent people doing all the communication. Themselves. But at the end of the day, this guy was was a general. Would he have would he have been brutish? Would he have had customs? Would he have expected people to talk to him in his, his own tongue? Would he have found it disrespectful to for them to expect him to speak? all their different languages when they're his colonies. So perhaps he, he wouldn't have been as fluent in uh, multi, multiculturalism as we think. Uh, and uh, back, back to what you were going to say, you agree with what I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, I agree that he speaks... Uh, that he speaks Welsh, a form of Welsh, and that Colburn definitely must have been involved from my point of view, considering its migration to, um, uh, to America, because like we said before, if 
it raises an entirely different can of worms if Colburn has been um, has been put in America independently. And then on the, even further from that, if it was a fabricated language, who's gone to the extent to fabricate it all over the world in different cultures? Because that's, that's an even bigger mystery. That is absolutely an amazing conclusion. Um, so I think what, 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 we've, what we should do is have another part two. I think we'll, um, it'll be linked to this, but we've got to work out what the content of two is. Um, yep. I'm going to... Go, I, I can go. Um, yeah, I'll include him in it, Luke. My bit. So, anyway, um, thanks ever any everybody for uh, liking, uh, um, liking, and and that wants to subscribe to um, um, Luke's channel, which Luke will mention in a minute. If um, obviously, um, if you want to come over to uh, RJ Langford, with, with and thank you very much for watching this recording. Over to you, Luke. Yeah, uh, any of my viewers that want to come over to, to like and subscribe to Carl's channel, that'd be great. He does some great content. Uh, he's not as uh, conspiracy focused as I am, but I'm sure we can bring him to the dark side. Dark side is good, Luke. You know, actually, that that is a conclusion. Let's go over to the dark side. I've really, really appreciated uh, this sinus with you today, Luke. Uh, we have had a few sound issues with you occasionally, but I think it's obviously a bandwidth stuff. But I've really, really appreciate. It. And and again, Luke, if anyone over to Luke's channel, uh, watch his channel. Um, and uh, Luke, you've got to mention about your channel a little bit more. I, I want to hear a little bit more. But this is this is goodbye from me. Um, and finally, last word, Luke. I mentioned your channel a bit more. What do you do on your channel, Luke, other than conspiracies? Tell us more. <laughs> well, at the moment, we just because I'm quite I'm relatively new. I only joined in November and uh, uh, recently popped off a little bit on YouTube. But I've been focusing on uh, Tartaria, which is uh, a whole can of worms that I can't get into now. But if you're interested in that, I've been looking at old world star forts as well, which is uh, which is quite a, a crazy subject to go into. So all that kind of stuff. And we've also uh, got a lot of Alan Wilson's work on King Arthur over there that I've uh, managed to rescue from uh, different sources. So if you're interested in that, you can watch that there because Alan Wilson was a massive inspiration for me to get into this. And whilst I disagree with some of his conclusions, um, he was he was definitely uh, a brilliant, brilliant uh, source of information for this topic. Hang on a minute. You're, you're talking about Alan Wilson in a past sense. He's still alive, isn't he? <laughs> well, yeah, but as in, he's not reactive anymore, is he? God, I, I, I thought there's something I didn't know then. No, um, I, I know um, that he's enjoying his retirement at this point, and it's it's up to us to carry on his his work. Yeah, I, I, exactly. And um, and Luke, one one last question. This, this is a this is a final dab in mark, right? <laughs> Do you believe that the Earth is flat? No. Nor do I. That's something we agree on. And I'm right. <laughs> right. Okay, that's all. That's all for me. Thank, thanks for watching this recording. And um, over and out for me, Luke. All right. See you later. Bye. See you later. Take care. Cheers. 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 Five, four, three, two, one. End point. And what we're going to do is Luke, we're, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll edit from here somewhere, I think. Um, and got it. Um, back to video and we can stop the live. Um, stop recording.